very slowly. Um, Aikido, I, I, for the camera, for the camera, this is Aikido exercise from Terry Dobson. The very first exercise was to very slowly punch each other in the belly, taking turns to do that. And to notice the reaction, which was like, <gasps> belly draws in, breath freezes, body draws back. And he said, how's, you know, how's your ability to move now? And of course, there is none. And so the practice was to learn to relax. And as the blow would come in, turn aside and let it go by. And to keep relaxed and to keep breathing. And that's a kind of fearlessness, Jerry, that, that, you know, that you're talking about. And then there was the ability to move and do something else. And for me, that's kind of been core to, the, to all the work with Aikido and frankly, everything else is to be mm -hmm. able to find that calm in the face of, you know, imagined or psychological or physical or, you know, planetary threat. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Um, thanks, thanks, Gil. Love that. Uh, this is the OGM weekly call for Thursday, September 14th, 2023. We were just talking a little bit about Aikido, about Aikido because uh, mid-October I'm supposed to test for first Q, which is the end of the Q ranks and the beginning of the Dan ranks. And when you get your Hakama, which is a dark overskirt that you put over your gi, <clears throat> makes you look fancier. But I was relating that I, I had somebody film me recently and I, I just didn't feel like I've internalized this, the, 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 the art that much. But, but there's a lot of other benefits, including a whole bunch of very nice metaphoric benefits. And I've seen a couple of speeches given about uh, Aikido as a metaphor for business or for ecology or for society, and they're pretty good. Um, but I think there's, there's a lot of good juice there because uh, Aikido is so much about blending with forces that are coming at you and instead of blocking the forces. And very often the best way to, to manage change is not to try to stop it from happening, but rather to shape it, blend it, direct it, do whatever else. It's it's metaphoric, but I have also, it has saved my life more than two or three times on the highway. Hmm. On a bicycle or walking? Or on a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bicycle, maybe in a car. In a car? On freeway. Oh, yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Mm. I've never practiced car car keto, so that's a whole <laughs> don't 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 do that. It'll just show up when it shows up. I know, I know. And I'm figuring the other drivers aren't going to be that pleased if I try. No, so no. Um, welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us on this uh, in Portland, a beautiful day that today and tomorrow are going to be pretty warm. And then I think it tapers off again. Um, we are in check in mode today. And I was going to uh, say, let's use the S protocol with a modification for uh, Doug Carmichael's bigger question, because when we do the S protocol, often we're just doing, hey, what's happening in your life that's OGME, which is fine, but sometimes takes a while. And I, I'd love to sort of go through the check-in to get to the conversation today um, uh, with a little more crispness and direction. So the question that uh, Doug offers us, which I will find here now is, uh, what's on your mind that's worthy of serious conversation? Because he used to run a group in Palo Alto called Serious Conversations. And so um, uh, as we as we check in, um, I'd love to do what's on your mind that's worthy of serious conversation. I will paste that into the chat. And uh, I don't like when I highlight everything in the chat, it uh, disables the, the the return keys and the arrow keys and all that. It's, they've changed the formatting of how the chat works to, in a way that wasn't that functional for me chatting months ago. Anyway, um, so, and then the S protocol is, um, which I pasted into the invite, but um, it basically says, uh, raise your Zoom hand when, I, actually, What's your preference, folks? Do you want to do the raise your Zoom hand to step into the queue, or shall we have the last person who checked in pick the next person to check in? That one. That one. So, okay, good. So whenever you're done, and, and I've discovered that whenever you ask somebody to do something and then you ask them to pick the next person, we always forget. So I might sort of remind us a little bit because that's a little hard to do. But uh, when you're done checking in, please name the next person. Uh, there's few enough uh, of us on the call that we'll probably notice like who's gone and who hasn't gone. And uh, the trick is to ask, hey, who hasn't gone yet? Raise your hand. And like that shows you who's missing if, in case you lose track. 
So that'll work. So, uh, so our practice will be uh, to uh, I will I will randomly pick somebody to check in first, and then that person will pick the next person. We'll go through the room that way. Uh, before you jump in, please pause. Uh, silence is helpful here. Take a pause coming in. Uh, I will not step in to, to do traffic control. So when you're done, please pick the next person. And I will prompt in the chat about please pick the next person if, if we need to. Uh, and then uh, when we're uh, only, only no conversation during the check-in phase, uh, just go once. And uh, after the check-in, we'll jump into conversation, possibly picking one of the questions that came up. So uh, please pick, uh, please sort of mind what we're talking about as we go. And uh, feel free, uh, in Doug's protocol, we don't use the chat during that check-in round, but I'm thinking let's be okay with using the chat both to memorialize what each person is offering to the conversation and to release our, our energies around chatting and sharing links and whatever else as we go. And then when we're done with the check-ins, we will launch into regular conversation as we do. Uh, so Doug Breitbart, would you... Uh, would you be so kind as to lead off, be the lead off batter in this process? I can do that. <laughs> um, so worthy of conversation, I recently had a couple of conversations that um, brought up sort of an interesting fundamental twist. Um, so the starting place was in relation to the Kogis, who are an indigenous tribe, I think all of you guys are familiar with to a greater or lesser extent. And the idea of the meme at the center being individual authority, agency, empowerment um, as a dimension of being in existence in Western culture. And in the Kogi context, that not really existing, that um, they have mamans who are oracles, basically. Mamans consult source. They have a water ceremony through which they do that. And um, so the question floats to the maman. The maman consults source. Source comes back. They read the bubbles and hand down decision, thumbs up, thumbs down. And there is no dimension whatsoever. There isn't even a conception or a possibility of someone in the tribe questioning, challenging, complaining, reacting to a thumbs up or thumbs down answer. It is what it is. It's, it's the natural order in alignment with natural law. Along comes Western culture and um, we eat the apple, right? It's the Garden of Eden time. And, and out of that comes ego, identity. Out of that comes self-determination, empowerment, individuation. Out of that comes separation. And fast forward to today. And what's missing connection, what's missing is recognition, awareness of collective need, commons need, natural law, the planet, what's in alignment, what's destructive, extractive. And it's not a matter of going back to Kogi's, like that's not relevant or particularly helpful. <laughs> it's a question of with individuation, with ego and identity and self-empowerment, um, What's the ingredient that maps to collective survival what, and change, which has to do with purpose transcendent of self, transcendent of individual? Me being in service to something bigger than just me and my interest. And with that, I'm complete. And I will hand off to Kevin. Wow. I mean, did we record that that was that was that was amazing um i i, I found that fun fascinating well i've been working for a while here in uh Buncom county locally and um but it's been separate from my work with neighborhood economics and so uh on a watershed fund that's a zero interest loan to local farmers 
And then uh, we had this, one of our former employees now leads a, uh, a, a food festival that was just had for food entrepreneurs, of which there are many, many here. And they struggle. A lot of them have to, you know, share kitchens and don't have kitchens and things. But they have this great circle where they would were showing you all that food, you know, in these in this tent, and then a big festival about it and everything else. And so we're going to create a neighborhood economics uh, food uh, economy fund that'll be reciprocal. And so, we, if you're a struggling entrepreneur and you get these zero interest loans. When you pay it back, you'll know which entrepreneur your money's been allocated to. So we're going to create it on reciprocity and then with some benefit dinners as the way to do it. And you have to have 20000 I mean, $10,000 of social capital in the network to qualify for a dinner. So it's a, it's a fund based on... Uh, monetizing social capital and then uh, and turning farmers labor into a, re a re reciprocal revolving fund. So I think it's going to be pretty interesting. And then we're going to experiment with venture philanthropy around it, you know, with our local congregation that wants to experiment on learning how to give to invest and, and but totally focused on this vertical. Uh, and uh, so anyway, that would be uh, that all just happened and this has happened a lot of times before I'm struggling for a couple of years on something that's not going anywhere and uh, I measure social capital by you can draw on it to have a $10,000 loan come out from a dinner from folks who, who care about you so anyway I had this idea of struggling along Rosie says oh touch here and it's like suddenly oh it blew up yeah that it works so anyway that happened this morning so that was kind of wild and I think we can create a whole interesting replicating uh, resilient system uh, around around the food. And you can't do that everywhere. We have a big farm to table industry, if you will, and food systems and stuff like that. So it works where this works. So that's my check in. All right, Kevin, you get to choose who's next. Gil, why don't you go next? Sure thing. Thanks, Kevin. Hi, everybody. Um, <clears throat> um, check in. Um, I've been on wall-to-wall -wall calls this week somehow. Um, really rich and juicy stuff, individual conversations and a conference in, in the Netherlands the last couple of days. Um, I'm struck by advice I got from a very insightful mentor a couple of weeks ago. He said, you know, you really need to focus on closing loops and nurturing relationships. And it felt very true. I took it very much to heart. And I find that I'm, I'm sort of swinging back and forth from one to the other. Like today is just wall to wall calls and there's all this stuff that doesn't get done. And if I'm getting stuff done, I'm not in conversation with people. So I'm dancing in that. Um, um, <clears throat> other parts of the check-in, critical path capital, my uh, escapade to um, build a private equity fund for good uh, to, to generate ecologically grounded and community rooted and employ on companies uh, has new fire under the pot this last month. Lots of momentum there, some very interesting developments. So I'm really thrilled by that. That's been another that's been another pendulum swingy thing for me where I have days and weeks where I think this is just too big a lift. I'm crazy to even undertake something like this. And um, I'll get to focus. I'm sorry. I thought we were doing a little bit of check-in, Jerry. So um, um, anyway, I'm, trying so to, I'm trying to alter the format a little bit this week by having us focus on the focusing question and not do a okay. general everything that's been going on just to see how it goes. Okay, so I'll wrap up there. So another another swinging back and forth between feeling completely overwhelmed and feeling like this is my calling to do. Um, the, uh, this, the, 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 the on my mind worthy of serious conversation, and this came up again with this conference this morning, is um, I hear lots of discussion about transforming the world that we're in, um, uh, transforming, reforming, dealing with, with crisis and collapse and so forth. And what I find really missing um, is, is diagnoses of the problem. Um, uh, and I hear echoing in my head, someone who once said to me that, you know, the prescription without diagnosis is malpractice. 
Uh, and so when I think about the whole sustainability matrix and the mess that we're in, uh, I've been thinking a lot about what I'm calling the structural defects of, of late capitalism. Uh, not the ways to make it nicer with reform, conscious capitalism, ecological capitalism, stakeholder capitalism, and so forth, all these good things that don't seem to get at the core of what's what's broken. And I've got a list of six that I've developed and I'm working and writing on. And Pete, this is one of the things I'm thinking about, uh, Neil book kind of stuff for. Um, uh, and shall I quickly rattle through the six? So I think that's that's part of the conversation worth having. Um, I, I think you've mentioned them here before, but it would be good okay. to have a repeat. So go actually, please go ahead. They're quick. They're quick. Um, <clears throat> built into the game um, and not addressed by any of the reforms that I've heard talking about is, is accumulation without limit, extraction without reciprocity, alienation without care, abstraction without ground, generation without regeneration, and privatization without solidarity. And I'm claiming that unless we address those, we don't get to where we need to get to. And I'm further claiming that, that those provide a design frame for developing and guiding and evaluating our initiatives to say, are we really getting to the core of the problem? So that's it. And I'd love to talk with people uh, more about that, anybody who's interested. And you get to pick who goes next. I do, don't I? Um, I will pick Stacy. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I, I guess this is worry, worthy of serious conversation because it addresses the here and the now. This mm -hmm. um, idea of picking the person that goes next was so incredibly uncomfortable for me for a number of reasons. And because it was so incredibly uncomfortable, it was hard for me to enjoy everything that was said. Because, and I was really interested in what was said and I couldn't even get there. And I wanna say, if, the extra, if it was an exercise where before the person picks, they took the time to tune in to the energy and to sort of practice their skills at seeing who maybe should go next, I would have been all for it. But because I didn't feel it was like that, I felt like I was standing in gym waiting to be picked for dodgeball. And it was not fun. <laughs> so that's what I wanted to share. So thank you. <laughs> and I think it's worthy of conversation. <laughs> Oh, I'm supposed to pick. I thought you were maybe getting into that spot you just described. So yeah. And and by the way, feel yeah. free to modify the protocol by doing exactly that. And I urge everybody else to do that. Basically take a moment. Uh, maybe the pause is at the end of what you're talking about. You let that leave you and then you center into who might be next. And I appreciate your, um, your telling us. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate you telling us your discomfort with the protocol. For me, it was just like, just another protocol. It's just a lever. But I realized that every lever ha touches people in very different ways. So I really like what you said. Thank you. So I could go two ways. I could either see who wants to go next, or I could just go and say the original thing that was on my mind when I came to the call. As as a topic, you mean to, for yeah. conversation? Gosh, I don't know. You're complicating the whole protocol, and I think we may have just done some time travel. But why don't you start with the topic you thought you'd talk about when you came to the call, and then pick somebody? Okay, especially because Mike is here. I do want to mention it, because I, I am very concerned, because I, I believe that there is an abundance of doctored YouTube videos coming onto the scene now more than in the, you know, in the recent past. And... I'm really concerned about it because I think there needs to be some sort of coordination or a team that can authenticate these things or do something. I mean, I've kind of just pulled away from Facebook because it doesn't feel like safe. But on the other hand, that's not a good thing to leave that whole, I mean, it's like the Wild West there. And it scares me because I saw what happened in 2016. So 
I guess um, I want to throw out this idea of some sort of plan has to be put in place to be able to maybe hold accountable, you know, bigger platforms for allowing these doctors. I don't know what could be done, but I'll just share. I saw a very quick clip of Ari Melber and he was talking to uh, Bill Maher and he had showed him this doctored video where Bill Maher was giving an endorsement. Bill Maher was like, well, any idiot can tell that that's not real. And I was like, no, I wouldn't have questioned it. And that's really, you know, when I see something on TV and like the words are off to the to the um, picture, I usually think it has something to do with streaming. I don't think it's a doctored video. Now, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But I think this is a big concern that that is not getting addressed enough. And even if people at least knew that it was there, that would at least be a start. So that's what's on my mind. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, um. Mike, you can go next, <laughs> self-serving as it may be. <laughs> Thank you so much, actually. I just wanted to pile on that because my topic was quite similar, a little broader. Um, first off, I apologize for being late. We had our monthly Carnegie uh, senior staff meeting. Um, and uh, I have to say it was damn, damn, damn depressing. We have two brand new Ukraine experts trying to talk about how we're ever going to get to reconstruction and uh, and particularly the psychic recovery um, and, and the problems with returning Russian soldiers who will be really messed up and might possibly have guns in their house. Um, First off, uh, uh, greetings from my new townhouse or our new townhouse. This has been the what, what's been disrupting my life for the last six or eight months, eight uh, eight weeks. But we finally have most things out of boxes, and now we just have to figure out how to hang all our art and figure out what we really need accessible and what can be buried in the in the garage. Um, and that that relates to what I'm going to talk about and that is the decline or disappearance of business ethics um, we've been buying a lot of things and trading you know you know we have we're now on phase three of our real estate adventure i i sold my house in may we bought this house in august and now kathleen's house is for sale and we're trying to make sure that that uh goes well and goes quickly and it's it's always very anxious we've already turned down one one offer and then you sit there thinking well will that be the best offer i get and so and and, and that's that's step one on the business ethics question it seems like the real estate industry is is just designed to give a whole bunch of people more information than you have and to actually not benefit you because of that but that's minor compared to my big complaint, which is uh, uh, yesterday's experience with my uh, auto mechanic. Um, I've been using this mechanic for 30 years. And, you know, in the past, they were very good. Recently, I thought they were growing more and more incompetent. But in the last three months, they have put the wrong transmission fluid in my car which led to it having all sorts of problems. And when I went back to say, what's this? They said, oh, well, it's just getting old, you know, probably time to buy a new one. Um, I had to go to a different dealer, who, a different mechanic, an independent mechanic who said, well, I don't know who did this, but you have the wrong fluid here. And then yesterday I went in, I'm selling the, this car and I, I had a little cosmetic work to be done. And they said 249. And I show up the next day and I, get a bill for 349 and they've done a bunch of things that I didn't ask them to do <laughs> you know <laughs> and I, I I did complain and they did get me back to 249 but I I just keep seeing this and I, I we had we spent four seven hundred dollars getting an air conditioning unit repaired it's worse than it was they drilled a hole in the coil so they had to spend three hours removing the whole thing and and repairing the coil i i just again i don't know how much is incompetence or how much is 
finding ways to make more money from you. But it's just it, the, the, the incentives are all wrong. So many people will make more money if they don't do things properly or if they if they if they look at a problem and they say there's three possible problems. Uh, let's fix the $1,500 problem first. And then if that doesn't work, we'll fix the $300 problem. And if that doesn't work, we'll screw this bolt in and charge you $80. And I just, I, I don't know how we get past this because not all of us are air conditioning repair people. And I I, I just, I, I, I sound like a, a moralist here, but where are the ethics? You know, aren't, aren't people being trained anymore to serve their fellow human beings. And maybe I'm just unlucky. Maybe it's just this year. I've just seen too much of this. I would add one more thing. And that is that when I was at Georgetown, I had a number of Chinese students and at least 60% of them seemed to have no sense of ethics. It, it wasn't just plagiarism. It was, you know, have, I mean, it was, it was, it was really quite, depressing and i and i i've had enough experience with americans who have done business in china to to know that you just don't know what you're getting and again the incentives are not there um one person explained it to me as saying this is what people did to get, get it through the uh, cultural revolution so the grandparents of all the people in charge now basically did whatever it took to get by and and avoid being sent to a prison or killed and so that that is passed on uh, again sorry to be depressing i can be happier later i'm excited about a lot of other things going on in the world particularly the fact that we have four glorious days of fall and that hurricane lee is not hitting washington dc i hope none of you have relatives in uh uh, Cape Cod, Maine, or uh, or the Canadian Maritimes, because it's not going to be good. And I will identify Gil, who put his finger up, which I indi I think means he has a response to will make me happier. Um, oh. So we're not in conversation mode yet, and Gil, oh. has, Gil has already checked in. So if you'll pick someone else, or just ask who hasn't checked in yet. Okay. Oh, I, since I oh I see Stuart. Okay, and I see him smiling. So I will. Look to him for some positivity, but first I want to say thank you, Stacy, for being here, and thank you for expressing your concerns. I actually thought the picking was a great idea because it prevents me from multitasking. It means I have to always be on listening very carefully, uh, just like paper chase, but um, I know it goes both ways. So, Stuart, over to you. Great. I'll check in quickly because uh, apologies to all. I need to um, leave because, Mike, and maybe this will cheer you up. I'm going to teach a three hour virtual program to uh, Sonoma County employees on ethics, <laughs> which I designed, which I actually designed myself. So it's, it's, uh, I'm, I'm rather excited about it. I did it once in May and it had a great, a great response. So I'm happy to do it again. Um, things that are worth talking about. I realize this is in the personal realm, but for me, it's very worth talking about. Um, my meds are about to be cut in half. I'm going on a maintenance drug. The uh, nasty shot that I got uh, weekly is going away. Um, and, and, and so all this is about uh, being evaluated for stem cell transplant at Stanford, which I'm, I'm, I'm actually pleased with. So that's the, that's the personal check-in. Um, I think I may have mentioned this in last week's call, but you know, one of the things that I identified as a key piece going forward, if we are to, quote, reinvent the species, <laughs> would be how do we change our headsets? You know, Gil, I loved your six pieces, and I want to talk to you further about that because it's congruent uh, in, in some ways with something called the ten, New Ten Commandments uh, for a, a secular world. Um but one of the pieces I've been looking for is who has the real capacity to change the way people think, to, to just change our psyches, um, to, to, to move from the, the, some of the, what, 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 what Mike was just talking about to a world where humans can flower. 
And I've been starting to study the work of Sadhguru. And it's really interesting um, because, you know, you all know that one of my, one of my teachers has been Meg Wheatley in the, in the, in the Warriors for the Human Spirit, which is all based upon Buddhist practices. Her, her, her mentor for many, many years um, was Pima Chodron. Um, and and the work of Chogan Trumka, who founded Nairobi University. Um, and all of a sudden, she's following Sadhguru. And I read his two books, uh, one about um, uh, karma and, and one about what he calls inner engineering. Um, and this guy has really got a great handle, I think, um, on how it is that we can shift consciousness, evoke consciousness. Um, so it's something worth talking about because it's a critical piece of the puzzle beyond you know technology, beyond capitalism. Um, I've always had this image of human beings on a um, conveyor belt. And when they get to a certain point on the conveyor belt, a bell jar drops and somebody hits a gong and they come out <laughs> transformed, evolved, fixed, whatever, whatever word you want to, you want to use it, but they're able to in, in, engage um, with life at a um, completely different level. So that's my, that's my check-in in terms of um, what's important. Um, and I will pick um, Doug. I was going to pick Eric, but Doug just looked up at me and with this look <laughs> on his face, and I said, "I guess I got to pick Doug." <laughs> well, a lot of things are on my mind this morning. I'm leaving for Malaysia this afternoon for an indeterminate length of time, and I'm going, having spent a couple of months in Montenegro and looking at the Balkans, I want to see what people in Asia are really thinking about climate change. So it's going to be a big adventure. We're also doing a project up in Borneo in the jungle of doing garden world villages. Uh, and that's going to be pretty interesting. And I'll keep you up to date with that. Uh, in the meantime, uh, yesterday I attended a couple of seminars put on by Physicians for Social Responsibility here in Northern California. And I was really impressed with the degree of interaction they have with new medical students, uh, with mentors, uh, and with very serious look at, in particular, uh, the pollution effects of climate change. CO2 is actually not very good. It's heavy, and it sinks to the ground, and it replaces oxygen and can actually suffocate people and all other living creatures. And they were as forthright about this as any professional group that I've had any contact with, and I was impressed. The problem they're facing is the state rushing to support a hydrogen infrastructure when basically I think we know that that's a, a waste. Uh, and, it go, and it goes along for me with a deeper feeling that, look, don't we know enough now I'm going to try and say this calmly. We know enough now to know we're not going to make it. And the question is, how should we spend our time in the meanwhile? And I'm going to stop there. And who hasn't gone? Hey, Jerry. Oh, and I'm going to call on Klaus and let Jerry have the next. Klaus? Yeah. Yeah, along those same lines, um, I started focusing on how do you engage at community level, you know, understanding that each community is unique uh, in, a, in a sense of the environmental conditions they're dealing with, the socioeconomic conditions and um, socioeconomic realities and so on. So I developed a process structure of wanting to engage and I tested it here in band, you know, and it's um, it also is under the, the idea of innovations brokerage. You know, how do you connect people? So what I've done is create a project and I found some, some locals who, who were just uh, young, some young professionals, you know, just on fire, really interested. Um, and I ended up creating this project with them. Then I put an article into the local newspaper 
um, that uh, stimulated interest. And then we partnered with uh, a tech group that is also local who decided and I convinced them that there are so many, so many changes coming through the agricultural sector um, and there is such a shortage of talent, you know, tech talent uh, in the agricultural sector that uh, they should really take a look at it. Also, I'm, I'm going to the local tech meeting and there may be like 35 people showing up and 30 of them are looking for work, you know, because the, the, the everything is changing so fast. And so there, there is really a, a you know, sort of a hunger in this group of where am I going to go? No, I mean, it's serious in a sense of uh, uh, for them to you know, wanting to make a living. So we, we went, my, my local team, we have a citizen climate lobby, a local chapter. Um, we ended up getting partnering with a local microbrewery, Worthy Pouring, uh, and the owner is very engaged you now in, in uh, uh, environmental issues. He you now buys his, his uh, hops local and so on, his grains, and you know, has his own herb garden and all of those things. So make a long story short, um, we made enough noise to where we oversold this thing. We had 114 shares in the room, um, which were solid filled, plus about 10 people standing in the back of the room. Um, and we screened this movie, Kiss the Crown, but a shortened version. You know, I've been working with the Kiss the Crown organization for some time. So they created a, an extract that is only 45 minutes long. It's totally focused on here's how soil works and soil functions, and it, it's really excellent. Um, then I uh, had a panel, the local school district, the the uh, director of uh, nutrition for the local school district here in Bend, and they serve, you know, I mean, a lot of meals. They, they, they cover every school in the Bend area. Um, neighborhood impact, you know, the person who is is feeding you now about 800 little children uh, under the age of five um talking about you now what he's struggling with we had the local soil and border conservation district represented we had a farmer who is just you know a startup young farmer who a, a lady who is just so innovative and and they all brought their own friends you know so the discussion went really well. We had a county commissioner join us. Uh, Senator Merkley sent someone from his staff to join. They actually, they actually called me uh, once the article came out. And then we have a Republican Congress person who also sent her a senior staffer to join us. And I was able to talk about you know, the, the bills that are pending right now and the confrontations in Washington this $19.5 billion fund that's supposed to help local food systems evolve, not just the farmer, but the entire system. So it was really, it, it was a home run. It felt so good. You know, we had, a, 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 a we, we got in, we, the county commission engaged and it turned out, you know, that uh, our soil and water conservation district is not funded. You know, it, it's, it's completely, is uh, struggling for funding, so they don't really know how this works. You need this for seed money. You need to lay an infrastructure in place to access federal money, and this, that uh, now is completely missing in the picture here. So this is this is a a process formula that I developed. There. It takes about three months from uh, uh, building the idea, developing an abstract. Uh, creating the physical needs you know, to find space and all of those things, and then building a panel. Um, but the process is even more important than the event itself because the process creates attention, creates excitement. You know, people, when you pick the right panel, they bring their own friends, they talk about it. So it, it was, it was, uh, it was good. So already, you know, they already already have two groups planning the next event. We're planning the tech group now uh, wants me to to organize with them a uh, uh, a deep dive into what's going on in terms of tech in agriculture. You know, when you think about precision agriculture, um, there there is there there's just a ton of moving parts. You think about carbon markets, 
there's just so much going on. So I'm very excited about this part. And then, uh, you know, this is this stunning number that 40% of all food that's being grown globally goes to waste. 40%. I mean, how is this even a number, right? But it's true. You go online and you find it's 40%. So uh, the local team, the CCL team, we want to talk about food waste. You know? So we're not doing an overview. You know, where does it start? Where does it end? And so on and so on. So in any case, we got to translate what we're talking about, you know, at the national level and and at the uh, uh, at, at you know in, with with organizations like Sierra Club and CCL and so on that operate nationally, we have to translate this into the community and and put energy into the community, and so that that was that was uh, that was a, a nice boost, you know, for me to, uh, to for confidence building and so on. Yeah, and I'm going to hand it over to Kevin. Um, we're not in conversation mode oh, yet, not guys. Conversation, yeah. I just want to say, Klaus, I'd like to offer you our funds. Uh, we have underwriting due diligence and stuff. And no, you know, and we'll, I'd love to engage in uh, you being able to raise through our platform. So anyway. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. That, that's a great offer. Uh, Klaus, who's next? Ah, who is next? Um, how about Scott hasn't talked yet? Scott Mearing. Hi, everyone. Um, serious consideration. Um, I had two that I think are, are, are interesting. The first one that I put in the chat was about what is enough? Or in other words, what areas are enough? Because I know my own tendency is to keep looking for more. And I notice that a lot of times when we branch out, uh, Doug will jump in and say, yeah, but we already tried that and we know that it doesn't work. Or we already, we already know that this path is not going to work. And we know that this would work. And... Um, we often have things that that seem to pop up like that, where someone will suggest something, and we we say, "Yeah, we already we already know that will work, and it just hasn't gotten steam yet, or it won't work." And so I just wonder if our tendency to look for a different answer is taking us away from the things that are we actually already know. You know, what what are our focuses, or what are the things that are okay? You know, we're complaining about little things that are going on in our own lives. I was like, okay, is that is that a big deal? Really? Comparatively? And I know, climate, huge. Food, huge. All of that stuff, it's so huge. And it's like, well, I just want to complain about my little thing that happened to me yesterday. Okay, I get it. But, you know, in terms of a, a serious thing, one of the... I was like it in movies where, you know, people are running around, someone shoots off a gun because they're trying to get the the person running away and everyone ducks. And then there's one person left standing up. And it kind of feels like that's a, it's a it's a visual metaphor, but it's a bad metaphor for what I'm trying to say, which is to say, if we just turn down the volume on everything, it doesn't matter what's left. And that's a. Um, it's a focus thing, focusing thing I'm trying to do. Fewer things and better instead of more things and, you know, dilution across everything. Um, so that that was one that I thought was a, an interesting focusing question. Oh, I also have a quick personal call out. Ah, my, ah, it's all blurry. I don't want it to be blurry. Um, just turn off blurring your background. It's busy. Yeah, it's, it's busy trying to find quickly? you and only you. So yeah, go to video. Uh, oh, there we go. Okay, perfect. There we go. Do you know what this is? This is an oil painting. I've heard of it's these. The only oil painting I own. Do you know who painted this? I'll give you one guess, and you can see them right now. I reached out. Yeah. I reached out. Very good, Stacy. You get the gold star for today. 
<laughs> I reached out to Doug and saw that he had all these wonderful paintings on his website. And I asked him about one because it spoke to me. And now I am the very proud owner of one of Douglas Carmichael's original oils. And I'm very pleased about that. So thank you, Doug. Um, so the second thing that I was wondering about, and this is, again, these are maybe small things, maybe big things. I don't know. Um, I was talking with my wife this morning about this, and I noticed that with the rise of anxiety in young people, there's this, a bunch of empowerment memes. Go get it. You're the best. Don't settle. You know, be fierce, whatever. All of those things wrapped into one. And you see them just fill up feeds. And on the other side, there's the um, images of people on vacation, people all dressed up, people with retouch, people with new clothes, people with all the things that... And I thought, you know what? Both of those are about you're not you're not good enough. You either don't look right or you don't have the right clothes or you need to be more. You need to speak up more. You need to do more. You need to... And I thought, you know, those things combined are... They seem like they are saying the same thing, which is, mm, no, you need to be better tomorrow than you are today. And I wonder if that's just a hamster wheel that's causing, well, it used to be, uh, it, was, it was particularly bad for young women, and now it's becoming young men as well, who are bombarded with images of, this is what you should be, do, look like, and Go get them, because if you if you aren't, then you're wasting your potential or your, or whatever it happens to be. So, um, it's difficult to have a movement of any kind if people are wallowing in their own heads with messages about this is what you need to be going after, as opposed to being okay with themselves and understanding that they are good enough and that there are other things that they could spend their time doing that might actually make them feel better in a way that they didn't expect. So those are my two call outs for topics of serious consideration. Oh, and I suppose it's my turn. Um, I don't believe Pete has gone, has he? No, Pete, I love your background. It's so, it's so 50s space future. <laughs> I always love that push pull. So Pete, the floor is yours. Thank you, Scott. The funny thing about my background, uh, it's, I, I like some other ones. This one is bright actually um, bright is good as a background. I've got some uh, older looking ones uh, that that don't work as well. They're, they're almost cooler. Um, uh, thank you, Stacy, for um, for talking about the the picking people. I think picking people can work. Um, and I like your idea of, of quieting down and reflecting on who you should pick. And thanks, Scott, for picking me. Um, uh, I had severe trauma from uh, d dodgeball in uh, middle school and being picked and stuff like that. I actually got out of it. I, I, I begged the teachers and they gave me independent study, uh, reading a book or something like that. I was, must have been a really, <laughs> I mean, I was like <laughs> crying at, at the teachers. Um, I have a... Um, uh, Jerry, it would be kind of interesting to, to reflect on how this call went um, and how, how it, I, we've, I think it's interesting instead of, um, uh, you, you asked an interesting question. I know the whole thing was emergent and thank you for being a wonderful host. And this has been a wonderful call. Um, you asked an interesting question, which is uh, Doug, Doug 
DevOps uh, protocol, uh, what's an important thing to talk about? So that means we've talked about a whole bunch of different things. And at this point, um, I don't even know if my thing is worthwhile bringing up as, as you know, and then there's like four or five or six different things that, that I feel like we could talk about. So it diverges super quick. Um, I, I do, uh, so I read an email from a mailing list uh, today and I said, wow, this is a little bit different than, than stuff that I've, I've read before. And uh, it's what we talk about in OGM and I wanna share this with OGM. Um, I wasn't thinking I would do it on this call, but, um, but here we are. Uh, so this is a, uh, I kind of tried to summarize the important parts of, of an email that, that called to me and uh, um, uh, so there's a link to the whole email and there's a, a little bit of a thread about it. But, um, but Brian Holmes, don't know him, uh, said a, a couple of interesting things about truth. Uh, so uh, everybody knows truth is under siege or something like that. We, we talk about what does truth mean? How do we find it um, in this group? Um, so a, a thing that I really like that he said is that truth has to circulate socially if it's going to become uh, common property. Um, he talks about small groups, um, small and, and an interesting, the, the best thing out of the email that I found was this idea of growing inwards. Um, you need small groups to come together. You need them to be internally diverse, um, not just in race or something like that, but viewpoints and um, experiences and backgrounds and you know temperaments and things like that. So when you've got small groups um, incubating ideas, uh, he, he, he says this is from um, an Argentinian, I think, um, a person who, who studied a revolution. And uh, the, the small groups coming together can think in a way that the larger society cannot. And then they can kind of like build something that's, that makes sense. And that then it can, and it can bubble out into the world. I'm watching, um, uh, I'm watching uh, a group that needs to say something needs to, to have a voice in, in a really important topic in the world, uh, not saving the world, but, but it's still a really important topic. Um, and I can see there's a, a set of, you know, I, I am kind of by proxy, I have a view of a hundred or so people who kind of all know a truth that they can't yet share with the world because it's too revolutionary, too different, too, it, it, or too, too much of a throwback to the old days or something like that. It's just too different. And they kibitz and complain to each other because they can't complain to anybody else um, because the truth is too big. So, um, so I can see this process. They really need to kind of come together. They need to kind of come to an internal understanding and agreement about the truth because each of them has a little bit different view of it, like uh, blind people and an elephant. Um, you know, each of them, when they tell the story, they tell the story of this truth impinging on their world and then the way that they react to it. Um, and some of those things aren't the important parts, uh, but together, all of them, they can collectively come to what the important parts are and how you could communicate that to the rest of the world. So that the way he expressed that really hit for me um, uh, because I can see it happening in real time. And I apologize for being ob obtuse and obscure and not naming the truth or the, the, the group. It's, it's not my place to do it. And um, it's not their time yet to do it, but I can see that it needs to happen. And a little bit, I try to push and say, hey, you guys need to like, um, like collect your truth and hone it and be able to express it in a way that the world can hear it uh, because it's an important one. Um, so uh, the, last, the last thing he said that I pulled out of his email was that, um, especially for you know, people like us, um, science and enlightenment, enlightenment reason aren't enough to concentrate, constitute a truth that people can own. Um, uh, 
I, especially those of us who grew up in uh, scientific backgrounds and scientific educations, it's like, guys, come on, there's a truth. There is ab absolute objective truth. I don't know why you don't, when I tell you something like carbon is going to kill us, you know, uh, I don't know why you just don't go, oh yeah, of course. Why don't we all figure out how not to do uh, CO2 poisoning of the, the planet? You know, it's like, that makes so much sense to us. That's not the way humans work. Uh, so he says humans need com cosmologies, um, and so and that we actually don't even know how to how to create co cosmologies anymore. You know, those of us who have gotten so seduced by science and uh, enlightenment, um, you know, have gotten you know how to actually be humans and be with the rest of humanity um, in the uh, innumerate and consonant cosmologies that we need to face the world. Um, uh, I've had a feeling that I was going to pick Eric for a while, and I choose Eric. Thanks, everybody. Um, it's been hard for me to get here due to work, and uh, but I'm here today. Thanks. Um, I want to pick up on what Stacy and Peter were talking about. Stacy talked about YouTube uh, issues with deep fakes and uh, Pete's theme of truth. Well, let's think about what happens when truth can no longer be known. What happens to our society when people are all being manipulated in different ways and no one can know what, what is the real truth of any situation. So it leads me to um, the current time of the year, Jewish holidays are starting tomorrow. And uh, regardless of what you believe, where is your spirit? Do you have a spirit? And what is it? Does it guide your life? Is there more than just our brains? So, and uh, yeah, I'm just looking at my notes here, like uh, related to truth is paradigm shifts. Are, do we need to shift our paradigms at this time? Um, related to the fake, uh, deep fakes, uh, reminds me of the fake banana concept by Leo Biscaglia. And, um, Another thing is like, is there a blind self to any of us, things we don't know that people are seeing that they don't tell us? So just a lot of concepts uh, connecting there. So this time of the year, like it should be a time of reflection and um, thinking, well, where am I going now? If it's really, acknowledging our past, letting it go. And a, a rabbi once told me, oh, you want to make different mistakes this next year coming up. Don't make the same ones over again. <laughs> so with that, yeah, I see um, it's about really relating to people locally and uh, finding my purpose where I am. And I'm going to just post some videos for people who have the time to look at it, who, who are interested in other things I'm thinking about. So with that, I'm complete. Okay, so who else hasn't gone? Uh, Jerry, go ahead. And also Carl. Um, I don't know if Carl wants to skip or not, but um, I will go and then I will ask Carl to go after me. How about that? Um, thanks, Eric. Uh, this has been a messier call than I was hoping, but a lovely call in different ways. Pete, I'd love a debrief about it, but not right the second. Um, Stacy, again, thanks for jumping in and saying, hey, this is not so good. It feels like dodgeball or whatever. Pete, I can't believe that PE teachers had you go sit and read like they could have given you something physical to go do. No, no. Anyway. Ooh. Um, my my question is kind of a hybrid inspired by partly what showed up in the room and partly what I brought into the conversation, and I don't know exactly how to phrase it. So I'm going to say it as how might we explore identity as a path toward larger solutions? And partly here I'm saying, hey, 
early in the call, there was this this thing about how uh, the Kogi, uh, you know, Doug uh, Doug B talked about how the Kogi don't really have a sense of identity and separate agency, and that their actions are more collective. And I think all these words are freighted and inaccurate, but I'm sort of trying to to aim toward uh, uh, that. And then religion, which Scott brought up in the chat, but not in the conversation about, hey, maybe even the religion is flawed, we're missing some kind of binding agent. Um, one of the things that, one of the many things that religion does is it gives people identity, uh, but also apparently Christianity gave us a sense of individualism and individual identity, uh, which we didn't have before, which I find is a flawed narrative, but, but it's many people's reason for loving uh, the Christian sort of uh, approaches toward, and maybe I'm wrong and it's just Protestantism that did that, but I, like this whole idea of us as individuals with a personal relationship to God, et cetera, et cetera, that's mixed in to how we see identity, not the identity that religions give us, but the other angle of it of, do we see ourselves as part of a group or not? And I think my my quest around consumerism for the last 30 years has has taught me that, oh my God, we taught people that their identity is everything. They should buy markers of identity like Nike, not Puma. Uh, they should separate themselves from others by declaring their identity, that that the, the all-consuming value of, of you as a unique human being, et cetera, et cetera, uh, has fueled this mad rush into the dissolution of all the filaments. And the reason we use the metaphor of the fabric of society is that all those little connections are interdependencies that hold us together. And we have been busy snipping those away over the years, over and over and over, often to sculpt a personal identity at the cost of society. And famously, uh, uh, the Iron Lady, Maggie Trudeau, uh, Maggie Trudeau, uh, Maggie Thatcher, uh, said there is no such thing as society. Uh, in, in part of that movement, <clears throat> sort of to dissolve our offering money into how to fix society together, which a lot of conservatives object to because money is taxes are taking, but even participating together, that there's this uh, series of economic theories that say, no, greed is good and everybody acting in their own independent greedy uh, identity seeking, fulfillment seeking interest works out in the end because there's this invisible hand. And I think all these messy things are all factored in together into the mess that we're looking at. And I'll add the thing that I brought into the conversation, which is it feels to me like a lot of the fear in the in the room, and the room I'm talking about here is the planet, is about identity that a lot of deeply conservative people feel that white America, which is what it should be, is being overrun by just demographics, by numbers. It's going to become a majority white country soon. Oh my God, terrible. This should be a white, like seriously, do they know no history? Um, but every, then I'm, I'm in, conver in a conversation with a much more conservative person than I am right now who wants to ignore all the identity politics that are coming up and say, look, this is all about class warfare and, and, and economics. If we just fix the economics, all the other problems dissolve. And my little inner voice is like, no, no, no. Like there's a whole bunch of people whose identity is being squished, ignored, rolled over. And how do we come into a world that is plural, yet unified and intertwingled and interdependent? And how do we stop trying to be separate and broken and different and actually come back into being like a planet with a bunch of humans on it who are busy wrecking the planet who could, in fact, if they shifted their mindset, which also came up in the call, how do we shift our way of seeing, being, thinking of ourselves? Uh, we could, in fact, shift that entirely uh, on a moment's notice. It wouldn't happen, you know, it wouldn't need to take like decades and decades of change. We could just shift how we look at each other and see each other. Um, how we identify with each other, how we I, see ourselves in the crowd, uh, all of that. And, and I, I, again, I'm just poking at the question from all these different directions because I don't know how to say it properly, but it feels like the quest for identity is really important here. And I don't mean the establishment of my personal identity against the others as a unique human, I mean the very notion of how I identify in society and whether I see the society or not and what my responsibilities are toward it. Uh, all of that is kind of baked into the question for me. Um, so that was a way longer explanation of the question that I intended because I was hoping this round would be kind of a crisp set of questions. 
but that's where I am. And I'm going to go quickly to Carl so we can complete our, uh, our, our cruise. And then Kevin, you'll, the floor will be yours after that. Carl, the whole world hinges on your participation right now. <laughs> so um, actually picking up on what Pete said, I actually um, did a um, copy of thoughts that I've just captured today. And I've been using the brain to since mid-1999, I think. So let's see if hopefully this will work. Are you doing a screen share or what are you doing? Yeah, I'm trying to do a screen it share. It should work, but you're not sharing your screen yet. We're not seeing your screen. Uh, okay, let me do a yeah. Let me do a shared screen. Share your full screen. Yeah. Uh sometimes if you share only the brain, it doesn't work. There you go. You're on. Okay. So one of the things that's always intrigued me about the brain is um is all about the structure. And when you get the structure right, there's like this elegance that emerges and things. So I've captured the people attending the call. I just remembered I had to add Stuart because he was here earlier. And then I actually can make connections. So Doug talked about the Koji worldview, which is then linked to things that Jerry said. Um, the things I've tagged is as top the topics are the things that got brought to my or came to me as I was um, plus the things I wanted to talk about. So I've mentioned it numerous times, but um, Marjorie Kelly's book came out on on Tuesday, and she actually um, was interviewed at the um, Aspen Institute here in DC. I didn't have a chance to go to it in person, but it is recorded. And she actually brought up, um, she actually brought up Danella Meadows and the whole systemic leverage points and stuff. So and, um, the big thing for me, the other big thing for me um, has been um, well, again, getting back into the power of storytelling. Uh, in fact, I posted a link to it. Um, uh, this is a TED talk that um, Mary Alice Arthur um, gave, and she calls herself a story activist. So it's about taking back the power of your story and things. She um, she actually mentions a group she was part of in the um, like 20 years ago, and that's this Golden Fleece group that I've been part of. Uh, we actually used to organize the Smithsonian, Smithsonian Storytelling Weekend and stuff. So um, I'm really getting back into the, um, looking at that power of story and uh, working on telling my, telling my own. I've been, um, many of you know Jack Park, he, scolded me about 10 years ago and it's like, cause I have um, two of my mentors have, have uh, had such a transformative uh, uh, impact on the world. Uh, one is Doug Engelbart, many of you know too. And the other one is my, is William E. Smith who has this appreciation influence and control framework. Um, he was, he did a lot of work in, Columbia with the um, energy system down there in the 70s. And I always like, man, if the Koji people knew about Bill and vice versa, we would be in a much different world now. Um, he told, he got it. Um, he told, uh, his group told uh, Ray Kroc that McDonald's had to hire women. He did a uh, UN project about the role of women in Thai society and led to them uh, amending their constitution to allow the right to peacefully assemble. Of course, we've had a military coup since then. So what constitution there? But 
anyway, Jack criticized me and was like, stop telling <laughs> Doug and Bill's story. You got to figure it, find out, find your own. So that's uh, one of those major things like uh, Scott was talking about, uh, really hone in on just a few things and try to become a master of those. So that's one of them. The other thing that I've run across, um, just uh, no way to really get into it, but there's actually this whole evidence-based policy making um, uh, activity out there. There was actually a law that uh, that was signed back in um, 2018 by then President Trump. <laughs> Hard to believe, but um, that's so that's something I'm looking at um, and things, and then. Um, I said that Marjorie Kelly and her wealth supremacy, and I mean, she just zeroes in on strategic leverage points the way Danella Meadows too. So I think I'm uh, really looking at that and how do you, and I think that is a area to start with, um, like Scott done to, to, I think there's a lot of um, insights you could get there from like figuring out what is really important and stuff. So I'll stop there and stuff. But um, the huge problem I have which, with then databases and everything else is the, um, can you have the, can you have the like monolithic brain? I've seen it referred to like Jerry has, or just this one, <laughs> this one um, thing or, um, I'm, I mean, you're over what a half a million thoughts now in that one brain. I'm, I'm uh, yeah, five hundred more like having five hundred brains that have a thousand thoughts. Five hundred fifty thousand. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's um, yeah. So that's the struggle I've always had because you have that trade-off between duplication versus having everything together. But how do you like? How do you share it? I mean, yeah. So I got. I'm capturing a lot of stuff like um, Pete was saying that I'm not ready to share yet. So I can't just, I can't just have Carl spring that I open up like you, you have. So, um, so that the brain I just started, I mean, a little copied out a dozen thoughts or so that I captured today. So I do have an OGM like starter brain or mini brain, like uh, Mark Trexler talks about. So I could give that to people and people could take that and, kind of run with it if they're interested. Um, so well, I'll let, um, turn the floor over to Kevin then. Thanks, Carl. I'll step back in as moderator, Kevin. Or yeah, just a brief thought about, you know, identity being closed off. I think identity in a world, you know, post enclosures, private property centric and private property privileged world is different than a world where you live in, you know, an indigenous world of reciprocity and we are all relations, we share this land. And so uh, I think, you know, uh, identity in a world of reciprocity uh, and, and multi-generational thinking on the planet is different than a world, you know, where private property is, is privilege. And ownership is a word as vital as identity here. It's like, I think that those yeah. things are very, very tied together, like you said, Kevin. Yeah, and and so you know, we're finding that, you know, uh, rights of a river, and we just, rivers, because that's where people focus, is uh, countering the corporate power. Uh, and, and the people are really kind of liking that idea. So we're, we're seeing, we, th we think that's got something. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Kevin. Stacy. Yeah, I heard something earlier today that I was like, this is so key to what I try to say all the time, which was as a species, we really need to learn how to talk through our triggers. And that doesn't mean like the really big, big, huge ones, but just the little things, just to be able to notice for ourselves when we're being triggered and to be able to mention it and to have somebody hear it and not themselves feel triggered and then react. Just, it has to be like a whole cultural shift of just acknowledging what is and also seeing what is you know eric was asking like why well, i don't remember the words he used but who are we inside well i don't think most of us know a hundred percent and it's anyway i just wanted to mention that whole idea because that's what's nice about small groups had there been a hundred people here 
unless I was really in crusader mode, I would not have said, oh, I'm not comfortable with this. But because it's a few people that I've gotten to know, and I, you know, I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. One of my um, one of my practices is is gratitude. Um, so, uh, a thing that I wanted to say that I forgot to say um, is that I I know it often feels like we are living in cursed times. <laughs> there are many curses we seem to have plaguing us, and yet um, I am super appreciative. I feel super blessed to live in a time when we have so much, so much richness around us, so much going on, so much wonderful, like awesome, amazing things, so much connectivity to other people around the world. It's just, it's just mind-blowingly cool. And it's, it's such a time of abundance that that has become the primary problem for humanity <laughs> is too much, you know? Can you imagine like going back in time a hundred years or 500 years or a thousand years and telling your your ancestors you know you have ancestors that lived back then hey mom dad i have so much you would not believe it's actually kind of become a problem you know and they would be going like dude you know that's a problem that's a problem that you have you know like i didn't eat last week i didn't eat the week before that you know <laughs> and that's your problem work it out guys you know figure it out it's it's not that big of a deal you know be blessed don't be cursed. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. Class, whenever you want to step in. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I, I I just posted you know something that we have transitioned six of the planetary boundaries, um, and. Um, when you when you, you know, look around realistically, um, you can't put that genie back into the box, right? Um, I mean, the ice has melted, the glaciers uh, are going, the uh, sea ice uh, has its lowest point ever. So we have created disruptions uh, to the to the biosphere. Um, that have created a new normal already. You can't put it back in now. Um, and it is it is starting to run much faster than we're ready for. So, um, and and I, I totally appreciate what Pete was just saying, right? Because you have this amazing connectivity where you can talk with someone at the other end of the world Um and engage in conversations and and uh the tools that that we have are just stunning right when you when you work with chat gpt and see what you uh what you can do um it is just it is just incredible but the the how do you how do you capture the urgency you know, of the moment in ways that's constructive you know, because the last thing we want is to wait so long until, I mean, when you go into Libya and Morocco right now, um, you know, for them it's too late. I mean, how do you rebuild from there? Uh, and and we capture the moment, and we have sort of a really small closing window of time to prepare for what is invariably going to hit us. You know, and and it, it's it's truly inescapable, and it's much faster than we than we're prepared for. This this um, um, this climate shift you now is running at a pace that is just incredible, and truly we know that the that the, the the one thing we can do is basically put roots into the ground. You now is to put the, the, to to restore. The biosphere back to life as as fast and as uh, as intelligently as we as we can do and as we can as we know how to do, but we don't. I don't sense you know that that level of urgency. But then when I came into the community, and you point you point out there that water you know is connected to soil, and the damage we're doing to soil is completely preventable it's not necessary right we can do this differently 
and then you have this you know big uh, response which you know we now experience in the community. So it means we really have to get um, there, there is this top down bottom up uh, um, uh, intelligence that we need to develop to where we bring the information from the top to the base and then the community has to deal with that and the community has to has to work with that and people want to you know you see it that they, that they want to they just don't know how to go about it and so I, I mean how do you capture make make people understand what is happening without creating paralysis in the process right where it's just so horrible I can't deal with it and so that's what I'm missing, you know, is is conversations that are focused and and uh, and uh, uh, appreciate the the complete urgency of the moment. I mean, and I know it's not just me feeling this, right? I mean, when you look at uh, at the data, it's just it's just absolutely uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, stunning. And so I'm like mesmerized when I watch the news. You know, it, it's it's like I, I I'm it's like watching a train wreck in motion. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry. I don't mean to just depress, create any any kind of depressive thoughts here. But hey, we're in deep trouble. <laughs> no, I mean, we're in deep shit. And 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 we have to figure out, you know, how to create and, and to mobilize and create. A collective response that, that that actually stabilizes your community, stabilizes your local environment, you know, creates community that that uh, where where people protect uh, each other, you know, and so uh, it's happening in a lot of communities, um, but it's not universal and it's not supported in, in the way that it needs to be supported to really make a difference. And, and to really capture the urgency of the moment. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Carl. Oh, Klaus. Um, Carl has his hand up. Yeah, so, um, well, building on Scott's thing, I mean, one of the core things that from Doug Engelbart is about our augmentation systems and stuff. So there is the idea of, he thought, it was, I mean, that came out in 1962. So he was thinking about at the individual level, like whom to augment first. And it was computer programmers so they could um, build the tools to help build better tools. And he really generated a positive feedback loop of innovation and stuff. To, and uh, the next step in that is the net is, would be, a, he talked about networked improvement communities. So communities are systematically trying to improve the improvement process. And uh, actually a Carnegie, like with the teaching, the, the guy who was heading that really picked up on that. And there, when I did a search, there was 14 dissertations out there that had network improvement community in the title, all kind of coming out of that school of thought. Um, so then, so there's, he talked about HTML, um, eight, um, H -LAM T language artifacts and methodologies in which you're trained, which by trained, he really meant um, being the gaining the skill set so that you um, you could minimize the cognitive load to perform a task at hand. And uh, so then is there a Nick? Is there a Nick Hamlet <laughs> or whatever? So that's what Scott was getting to. So it's like, Carl Arg and Carl augmented by the brain, Jerry augmented by the brain, and the cow can um there's this whole thing about second brains um out there and 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 things. So I think that's another area that I'm kind of getting into is um is how, is how that so just wanted to bring those ideas up. Thanks, Carl. We're near the end of our call. Ken, I think, with his wife are traveling in Tuscany for a bit. I think that's why they're not here and they won't be here for a couple of weeks. Um, and that means we won't have a Ken poem at the end. So anybody else who would like to forward for poems 
and possibly bring one in would be great. Uh, go ahead, Scott. All right. Well, I, I only have one, but it's one I wrote a bunch of years ago. Is it a, it's a haiku? It, it's it's a haiku, and the, it's by it was put out by this the world's strongest librarian. Yes, he's a he's an actual personality out there. Um, but the haiku challenge was to write a haiku under the theme short romance. And so I will copy it and put it in the chat, but I will also read it because it's short. Um, eyes meet through the glass. Twinkle, speak silently, but the train rolls away. So again, the theme is short romance. And I know that we all have seen someone from across the room and had a short romance. Maybe only a few seconds, but you saw them, they saw you. And that's all it was. And that's all it needed to be. Love that. Um... There's a there was a meme also a six word memoirs is a thing and uh, my friend Charles Warren has a funny story about six word memoirs that I don't remember right now I wish I'm trying to remember it but it's not coming back. Um, anyone with a thought to wrap this call? Well, I just posted it, but um, that triggered uh, a friend of mine had a phrase, familiar strangers. So, mm -hmm. Right. And unlikely allies. And strange bedfellows. That seems like it should be a, a, a section in your brain, Jerry. <laughs> the strange bedfellows? Just all of those phrases that... Yeah show our our connection even when we don't realize that we have it or should have it should have it yeah oh the Hemingway yeah <laughs> and Emily Dickinson Eric posts to our chat thank you um Mike public service announcement the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development in Paris is doing some of the very best work on AI, what its social impacts are, and particularly what governments should do to shape how AI is used and prepare to the impacts. They're having a, it's a five-day meeting. Uh, they just wrapped up for the day, but tomorrow they'll have two very interesting sessions. For those of you on the West Coast, I don't think you want to be up at midnight, but um, you could uh, tune into the, the replays. And uh, it's OECD.AI. Um, really, really the right people asking the right questions and not totally diluted. Wow. Much That's better meeting from what I hear. Do you think? Because uh, it seemed like Chuck Schumer's meeting didn't go badly. It seemed like there were interesting things other than Musk sort of grandstanding, but it certainly drew a lot of attention and certainly everybody seemed to agree on some, like there should be some government involvement in regulating AI seemed like a consensus view. Uh, and, and we all agree that we should do something about social media. But... All right. Which goes back to Stacy's question earlier. earlier uh, point. Go ahead, Stacy. I feel really naive saying this, but it's something I think about all the time. So I'll just throw it out. I often wonder why we can't, why the tax code can't be used to sort of shape what happens with big tech companies and AI. And part of me knows it's not going to happen because the people working on it are not incentivized to do it. And that leads me to wanting there to be like this other philanthropic kind of agency that gets these great minds together to write up the plan so then the people can push it to those people that are then in full transparency have to either get behind it or not. So I'm just throwing that out there to you greater minds. 
I would definitely propose that at some point in the near future, we we ask that question. What are the systemic things that lead us to this venture capital-led, winner-take-all tech economy? Um, it, tax code is a big part of it because it, it really favors stock options and you know the, the companies that move fast and get first mover advantage, advantage. But the other one is patent policy and the ability to create artificial monopolies. Um, Carried interest, uh, Citizens United. Uh, there is a large bag of of precursor things here. Well, and just one other thing to add. I'm also very concerned about the number of jobs that are being lost through technology. You know, and if there was, you know, again, it doesn't seem that taxes have anything to do with how much money goes into the community where a business is. And I'm wondering why that can't be. Just just things that would be good to just talk about. <laughs> but we're talking about jobs that are lost. Why don't we talk about the jobs that are gained, right? Because there is such an urgent need for for people to train, uh, to to deploy these these technologies as they emerge and, Absolutely. and make a difference here. So I, I guess focus on on the opportunities that are available now. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking about going to a supermarket and where I knew people that were making a decent living because they had been at the supermarket for a long time. Now we're all standing next to this machine and there's people just watching and the people that at least were in a union that were at least earning a decent wage. They can't do that anymore. It, it, there's just a lot going. It seems there's a lot going on in the labor movement. So I'm not against technology. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm just trying to say there needs to be some way to make sure the money is staying in the community. Mm -hmm. um, I told a story yesterday that I need, to, I need to go fact check, but it's about longshoremen and containerization in shipping. Uh, New York City, Manhattan proper, and San Francisco used to be major working ports. The reason that San Francisco has neighborhoods called China Basin and India Basin is that the China Clippers and the India Kipler Clippers used to come into those places, and that's where all the, the goods would sort of get uh, taken off and, and so forth. And there were customs houses, the whole thing. Uh, at some point recently, uh, more much more recently, Sealand, I think, pioneered the use of containers, and all of a sudden, container shipping ate the world. And these companies were trying to, and the cities were trying to negotiate with longshoremen who were like, no, you are not taking away our ability to load and unload ships. That is what we've been doing. We have a trade. And I think what happened was they, they basically reached an agreement where the longshoremen's union agreed never to hire another person. Like there were going to be no new longshoremen. They guaranteed those people whatever benefits they thought they were getting. They basically made it so that their lives were going to play out the way they thought their lives would play out. And then the port of Newark and the port of Oakland became fully automated containerized ports, became huge working ports and took over. And now there's no uh, trade like this happening in Manhattan or San Francisco, none whatsoever. And so that all the shipping transformed and changed and the people being displaced were for one generation only sort of made content and allowed to move to something else or to go become automated port operators sitting up in the booth going, you know, whatever, I don't know. But this, the, the story of how labor transitions happen is brutal and ugly and long and intricate and interesting, actually fascinating. And, and government and union and other attempts to fight that are also fascinating. And that, that, that is a, really interesting piece of, of how things work. And the fact that you can ship a container or at least pre-pandemic, you could move a container of anything anywhere between two ports for $3,000 roughly was a piece of globalization's magic that made things really super cheap any place that and underpaying everybody along the way. Um, so anyway, sorry, you opened a, a can of worms in my head uh, because, because this is one of those issues that leads us down to the place that we're in right now. Is is how to and, and and right now we're facing a tremendous number of labor displacements and we're not having these conversations. We're not talking about <clears throat> useful, productive, and interesting ways. And the 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 auto union strike that's probably going to start tomorrow. One of their points, alongside other points, like hey, we want a thirty-two hour working week with forty hours of pay. Um, but one of their working points is uh, EV production requires many fewer workers. What's going to happen to the workers? Which may, reminds me of the longshoremen's problem. 
And the unions are trying to figure out how to protect the number of workers that are in the union because union membership size is one of their power bases. That's how they that's how they look strong and big. And EV seems inevitable. So there's this real messy thing going on. Um, well, with the image of the can of worms in my head and everybody's minds right now, I think that's a good place for us to wrap this call. See you in a week. And we'll, uh, I think next week we'll come back to the, our, our sort of collapse and renewal topic and see if we can't pick a, pick a piece of it and chew on it. If you have good ideas for how to make that more useful, fruitful, productive, enjoyable, uh, let us know on the Mattermost channel, talk out loud over there or on the mailing list. But I'm, I'd love to sort of go back there uh, another time. So let's be Thank careful you. out there. Thanks, all. Wax on, wax yeah, off. You look like you're cleaning your wax screen on. a little bit. Wax off. Sure. Get this little smudge off and this smudge. <laughs> Thanks.